Good morning, everyone. So nice to spend a little time with y'all on Friday morning. My name is Peter Boland, and if you're brand new, a special, special welcome to you here on Friday Reflections, our weekly 30-minute gathering every Friday morning at 10 Pacific here at San Diego Oasis. Thanks for being such a vital part of what this huge team of people are doing here at San Diego Oasis. I know you see my face on the screen, but, but all around me, there are teams of people, staff and volunteers and leadership and everything in between. Uh, who love this and who love what we're able to create together, all the different instructors, all the different classes, everybody bringing their little slice of life to these Zoom sessions. And, and the most important person here is you for your patronage and thanks for buying your ticket today and uh, for supporting all of the work that we do here. It's a symbiotic relationship. And and if we if we've learned anything this last terrible year of unprecedented death, suffering, upheaval, and chaos, is that growth comes only when systems come together and when individuals come together into systems. Uh, no man, no woman is an island, and we uh, coexist, as Thich Nhat Hanh, the great contemporary Zen Buddhist teacher, says, there is no being, there is only inter- being. There is only interconnectedness. And I'm, I'm always struck by that interdependency and symbiosis. We, we end up talking about that every week here, don't we? And we've been doing it for almost a year now. We've been gathering here on these, uh, on these Fridays. So thanks so much for being here and what the arguments were in favor for it and, and against and all of that. So we'll, we'll get into that on April 27th. So here we are, the Friday before Passover. And what is unfolding here in these next few days is nothing less than the holiest week of the Christian calendar. And Christianity, of course, is the dominant wisdom tradition on the planet, the dominant philosophy or religion on earth. And it is, of course, permanently and forever joined at the bone with Judaism. And, and so the two are, the link between the two is never more apparent than it is in these next seven days, <laughs> next nine days, all the way up to Easter. Uh, so let's uh, think about that a little bit. You know, tomorrow, uh, Passover begins at sunset. You know how the Jewish calendar works, right? The day begins when the sun goes down. And so today is the Sabbath or the Shabbat in Judaism, but it really doesn't begin until sunset at the end of today, the end of Friday. So too, Passover begins at sunset tomorrow, Saturday the 27th. Yeah. And it runs all the way to that following Saturday, uh, April 4th or 5th or something. So this, this whole next week is the, the Passover week. And every night uh, is, is a potential, if families want to do it, a Seder meal, a commemorative meal where the Passover rituals are reenacted and the, and the prayers are, and the liturgy of the, of, of the Seder meal is, is engaged. Um, you know, Passover, of course, is on the surface and a commemoration of the liberation of the enslaved Israelites kept in bondage for centuries, maybe 100,000 of them, not 100,000 centuries, 100,000 people in ancient Egypt under Ramses II, you know, all that, all that indentured servitude, bondage, slavery stuff. And, you know, the story of Moses and, and Moses is born into that enslavement and, and, uh, Boy, one could easily go on for four hours about this. Huh? Let me not let me not divert into a story about Moses. Let's let's stick with the, what we can do here in our time together. And 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 Passover, of course, commemorates Moses's and the Israelites' triumph over the Pharaoh and over the Egyptians and the end of this centuries-long time of slavery. And then the Exodus, right? This is all told in Book Two of the Torah, Book Two of the 
of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. So read that today. And it tells the story of, of Moses uh, accomplishing this break and leading the Israelites out of bondage across the desert to uh, eventually the promised land. Um, the land that was promised to Abraham and Abraham's descendants in the book of Genesis. So in the Hebrew Bible, this week is an enormously significant week. And what is celebrated by the Exodus? What is celebrated by Passover? Well, certainly Moses and all of that. But really, in the Seder meal ritual, it becomes clear that what we also celebrate, and I say we just very loosely here, it's not my tradition, but what we celebrate in Passover is all of our journeys from bondage to liberation. Think about that in personal terms. Any, any recovering alcoholics, addicts here on the call with me? Any people who found that their life became, when they got out of a terrible, untruthful, inauthentic marriage, found themselves going through that that dark night of the soul of divorce and came out the other end of that breakup reborn finally it, authentic finally real finally true to who they really were to thine own self be true as the sh great shakespeare line goes um anybody here felt that their education opened up a rich vivifying existence it certainly is true for me that I, that I wasn't really born until I went through my entire educational process, which by the way is ongoing <laughs> and never ends. Uh, it seems like every week is just another week at school, right? So does anyone else besides me feel like that is a journey from bondage to liberation? So that's what we celebrate in the Passover, you know, um, it literally Passover refers to the blood uh, being painted over the lintel, over the doorway of the Israelites in the slums of Egypt so that the spirit of death would not visit them and only visit Egyptian homes. Yeah, it's kind of a gruesome, typical kind of Old Testament sort of Punisher God story, right? So, Read it literally if you want, read it metaphorically if you want. I think you know where I stand on all those questions, but that's really essentially what we celebrate this week, that journey out of bondage to freedom. And by the way, uh, to awkwardly trans uh, se segue to Christianity, that's what brought Jesus to Jerusalem on the last week of his life was Passover. Just as when he was a boy, a couple of the Gospels tell us, his father, Mary and Joseph, brought the, the wagon full of kids, including Jesus, to Jerusalem for the Passover, as many Jews did. And so when, when Jesus returns to Jerusalem for that last week of his life, all four Gospels tell us that there was, you know, this, this as events came to a head, um, there was a procession uh, this coming Sunday, two, two days from now, that is known in Christianity as Palm Sunday, because all kinds of people started waving palms as Jesus rode in with his crew. He was a celebrity at this time. He had lots of followers. And, and Jesus rides into town and a spontaneous sort of, you know, phalanx of supporters and fans line the road to greet Jesus in a royal procession as though he were a triumphant king returning to his capital, right? This is how the story is told in the Gospels. And, and then, and those palm fronds now for many Christians who attend Christian service this Sunday, there, there will be the, the palm, the cross made out of palm fronds and all those are collected uh, to be burned. The ashes of which then become the ashes Christians will use next Ash Wednesday to make that commemoration at the beginning of Lent. So the annual calendar is all linked together in this beautiful kind of celestial sacred lattice work of interconnectivity between these, these, these stories and these rituals and the ritual reenactments 
and the events that that tell the story of uh, whether it's Jewish or Christian, tell the story of God's presence here, of the of the presence of the transcendent here in the dusty world. So Jesus comes riding in on Palm Sunday. Now, uh, Thursday of this coming week is known in the Christian world as Maundy Thursday. Uh, Maundy, funny word, right? It sounds like to when I was a kid, I thought they were talking about Monday, Thursday. I'm like, what the heck is Monday? Th Maundy, M-A-U-N-D-Y. And it comes from a Latin word, Modeno. Sorry, mode, Mondeo, M-O-N-D-E-O, Mondeo, which means command. So Maundy Thursday is command Thursday. Now I'll get to what that command was in a minute, but let's talk about Maundy Thursday a little bit and what happened. Now in the synoptic gospels, that'd be the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, but not in John. And also interestingly in a fourth place in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and all four of those places, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which, by the way, was written 30 or 40 years before the Gospels. You Bible scholar folks know all this stuff, right? Paul's letters were written between 45 and 62. And the first Gospel wasn't written until 70 to about 100. So we, you know, there... We don't have imp uh, uh, perf perfect dates on this stuff, but that's the general window. So in any event, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Paul in his letter to the Corinthians all tell the story of, of that last supper, that ostensibly Seder meal, where Jesus and, and his Jewish friends were having dinner, were on Passover week in Jerusalem, clearly a celebration a commemoration of Moses, who lived 1,200 years before Jesus. So it's already an ancient ritual in Jesus's time, yeah? So they're breaking bread, and, and I doubt they all sat on the same side of the table as da Vinci painted for us, you know? <laughs> but but um, I know it's, those images are just burned into our mind, right? The Last Supper fresco of da Vinci, or is it Michelangelo? Da Vinci. And that... Um, that moment when Jesus lifts up the bread and lifts up the wine and says, this is my body and this is my blood. And he says it a little differently in all four of those places. Like in Corinthians, he just sort of says, by these, you will remember me. By, by these, you will commemorate me. But in the gospels, again, which were written a little later than Paul's letter, Jesus ends up saying something a little bit like more grandiose, a little bit more profound that, that by taking in my body and by taking in my blood, you will uh, be redeemed. You will be cleansed of your sinful nature, your sinful behavior. So the blood and body of Christ as sacred substance that will affect a soul transformation in us this is the moment when the eucharist or the communion ritual is born it's just fascinating to me Anne, that that the jewish seder meal becomes the heart and soul of christian liturgy the eucharist or the communion but i'm also struck oh i, I can't skip over this part i'm also struck at what happened before dinner right before the food was served jesus gets a bucket full of water and a towel and he goes around and he without saying why or, or much about what, he just starts washing the feet of his disciples. It's one of the most, I don't know, th there's, there's a few haunting scenes in the gospel that really haunt me, but this one really gets me. It's really vivid. Imagine this, the teacher. And I know this isn't, this isn't Christianity even yet, right? Th that church doesn't exist yet. This is, these are Jews. But they see Jesus, many of the disciples, as a Messiah, as the presence of God. Clearly as their leader, at least, let alone a divine presence above all the prophets. And that's saying something in Judaism. And he gets on his knees and he's washing their feet. And some of the disciples are kind of freaked out by this. Like, hey, boss, get up off the floor, man. We should be washing your feet. But he doesn't argue, and 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 Peter, by the way, particularly is kind of like, no, you're not, you're not, you're not washing my feet. He kind of refuses the deal. It's like, no, I can't. We can't flip the hierarchy like that, dude. And Jesus, of course, does it anyway. 
And that to me is such a beautiful encapsulation of the way all of Jesus's teachings are more about behavior than they are about doctrine. You know, Jesus wasn't a theologian. He wasn't, he didn't have a PhD. He didn't go through seminary. He hasn't read all the books. You know, he's, he's, he's a working class guy. He's a healer, but not a scholar. And he's not going to argue with you about theology. But what he does is he votes with his feet and he teaches with his actions what God really is in the world and also what God calls us to be in the world. And that is the presence of service and love. You know, it, he's, he's a bodhisattva in that moment. You know, he's the embodiment of compassion. He's the embodiment of care. He doesn't, he didn't come here to condemn you for what you did in the past. He didn't come you to, he didn't come in that, in that room that night to uh, preach, but to just serve. And I, it brings to mind this current Pope, Pope Francis. I'm not a Catholic either, right? But uh, this Pope Francis is an interesting cat, isn't he? He's the first Pope from the Americas. He's from South America. He's the fir first Pope who comes from the Jesuit order. And the Jesuits are, are sort of notorious for being intellectually active and, and, and contentious and scholarly. And they like to argue against the church sometimes. So it's a radical... If you're not a Catholic, you have, probably have no sense of what a radical thing it is that Francis is now Pope. And, you know, he's still a company man, obviously. No one's expecting him to overturn <laughs> the church's core teachings, although he is pushing the envelope. It's, it's getting stretched in some places, but he certainly shifts the emphasis. What was Pope Francis's first act when he got to Rome as Pope? Well, he refused the motorcade. He got into a regular car. He said, I'm not riding around in that. And he doesn't live in the, in the palatial apartments where the Pope normally lives. He lives with the other priests. And the first thing he did was he grabbed a bucket and he gathered together, in fact, a number of prisoners from the prison there, Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, I mean, whoever. And he got on his knees and he went down the line and he washed their feet. That's teaching with your action. He, didn't, he didn't, didn't say much about it. but And then Jesus gives the new commandment, which is why it's called Maundy Thursday. Remember I said it was called Commandment Thursday. What was the commandment? Well, in John, the Gospel of John, which doesn't have any detail about the Last Supper, but it does tell us this moment. It tells us that Jesus gave a new commandment to the disciples. And he basically says, you know, this is the end of the road for me, but you all go on. And he says, from here on out, I'm paraphrasing, from here on out, people will know who my disciples are by how well they love one another, by how well they love one another. That's the mark of who the real disciples of Jesus are. Not the ones standing with their AR-15s in front of Planned Parenthoods, not the ones preaching damnation and hellfire against our LGBTQ sisters and brothers, not the ones full of divisiveness, hate, and who love to argue theology and doctrine. The people who are the best at loving are the ones who truly represent present the core message. I mean, Jesus says it in his own words. Reminds me of a Christian friend of mine who told me a story once. He said, you know, somebody asked me once, are you a Christian? And my friend said to this guy, he said, I don't know, ask my neighbor. <laughs> I was really struck by that. As Jesus said, by their fruits, by their fruits, you shall know them. So, and then after dinner, they go to the Mount of Olives and Jesus has all this doubt and all this pain. And it just tells me something about faith, you know, that faith does not mean having all the answers. It means living willingly, lovingly, and faithfully in the question. To let the longing for God be enough. To lean in. 
to whatever God is. And again, it's something that exceeds, of course, our understanding to lean into that holiness, the holy of holies, as it's called in Judaism, the mystery of mysteries, to lean into that, to feel your, your longing for it and to honor your longing and to lean into it and let the Holy Spirit meet you and shape you as it is going to meet you and shape you. So faith as freedom, freedom from even the need to argue or defend or explain or comprehend. Now, to atheists and materialists, this sounds like complete madness, and I respect that. I do. It does not fit into a logical syllogism. As Augustine said, the great mystic Augustine, I believe because it is absurd. Now, I don't know what belief means. I don't know what faith means exactly. But faith seems to be in, in, in much of Christianity, that same kind of sense of freedom that is celebrated in the Passover. And for those of you that are Christians, um, I've only done the Eucharist once and, and I, I'm not a Christian by definition. I haven't been baptized. But I speak in a lot of sort of liberal progressive churches. And when I was at one of them, I participated in the Eucharist. I was invited to. I'm like, am I allowed? And they're like, yeah. So I did it. And it was fascinating. And, and it's an amazing ritual. Now, it, again, it wasn't a Catholic church because it means something quite much more richer and profound uh, to Catholics, I suppose, because for them, the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation tells them that the bread is literally the flesh of Jesus. The blood is literally, sorry, the wine is literally the blood of Jesus. They are literally consuming the body and blood of Jesus. Whereas in many Protestant churches, again, like I said, it's kind of a, kind of a commemoration of Jesus. They don't literally believe that those substances are the literal body and blood of Jesus, but I'm, I'm past the place of having to argue about all that stuff anymore. You know, you, you do you and I'll do me. And I think that's good enough. And I'm sure that's fine with God. I, I, I don't speak for God, but, but I did want to share with you a quick passage from Thomas Merton. Uh, I've mentioned him a lot lately. Thomas Merton is the, uh, the great uh, Cistercian and Trappist monk, a Roman Catholic priest, a monastic who wrote the great Christian mem memoir called The Seven-Story Mountain. Just, uh, uh, I can't recommend it enough. It's a profoundly moving read. And he talks about his conversion to Catholicism. And I want to read to you uh, a passage from The Seven-Story Mountain. He was, he was 23 years old in grad school at Columbia in New York and uh, studying philosophy, you know, pretty much where I was when I was in my early 20s. But he went Catholic, you know, and, and it had been a long journey. And I won't bore you with all the details, but he tells the story of him walking to the Catholic church and getting the training in the weeks before. And then on this day, receiving uh, his first communion, November 16th, 1938. So he had just taken communion, the, the, the bread and wine. And this is what he wrote. He says, in the temple of God that I had just become, the one eternal and pure sacrifice was offered up to the God dwelling in me. The sacrifice of God to God and me sacrificed together with God incorporated in his incarnation. Do you see what's happening here? He's, he understands this as a unification with the divine. So the God within him is receiving the God into him. And the, and the death and, and sacrifice of God is the death and sacrifice of him. And the redemption of God is the redemption of him. He, it, the Eucharist is uniting him to the entire Holy Trinity experience. I'll go on. Christ born in me a new Bethlehem, and sacrificed in me his new ca uh, Calvary, and risen in me, offering me to the Father in himself, asking the Father, my Father and his, to receive me into his infinite and special love, not the love he has for all things that exist, for mere existence is a token of God's love, but the love of those creatures who are drawn to him in 
and with the power of his own love for himself. For now I had entered into the everlasting moment movement of that gravitation, which is the very life and spirit of God, God's own gravitation towards the depths of his own infinite nature, his goodness without end. And God, that center who is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, finding me through incorporation with Christ, incorporated into this immense and tremendous gravitational movement, which is love, which is the Holy Spirit, loved me. And he called out to me from his own immense depths. So I'm reading this, you know, as a non-believer, as a, as, a, as a student of world religions, you know, I'm a fan of all of them, right? And I'm reading this and something started to sort of crack in me a little bit. It's like, I think, thank you, Thomas Burton. I think I finally understand why the communion is so important for my Catholic friends, why some of them were in tears when I was on the phone with them last year, when all church services had to be suspended and they could no longer receive, for many of them, daily communion. I never understood ritual as deeply as I did in that moment. That this is not simply a perfunctory reenactment of a thing that happened two thousands of years ago. This is mystical union, something I am keenly interested in as I pour through my Vedanta and Taoist and Buddhist texts. So that was really something, and and all of that is happening this week. I mean, this week is a huge deal throughout the Judeo-Christian world, which is to say, um, for a lot of people. <laughs> And so I couldn't let today's Friday Reflections go by without that. That, you know, apart from your specific participation in Judaism or in Christianity, you know where I am. I, I, I wander about. But there is something really compelling about this Judeo-Christian narrative to me this year. And I don't know why. Some, I've shared with you here many Fridays ago that I'm participating in Lent this year. I did Ash Wednesday and, and I'm doing Lent and that's wrapping up here this week. Uh, that's why I deactivated all my Facebook pages and I may not go back because it's been awesome <laughs> being away from that noise. But it's really, you know, to, to pull back now because today's session has been specific to the Judeo-Christian tradition generally, but to pull back now and to universalize all of this but as we wrap up. Um, I found a Mary Oliver poem. There's always a Mary Oliver poem. And by the way, you know, she's sort of the nature poet. Those of you that are, were with me for the Walt Whitman webinar on Tuesday, you know, all that stuff about everything is holy, you know, and that, pan, that pantheism. I think Mary Oliver basically lives there too. She's sort of a nature poet, a pastoral poet. But later in her life, she became more and more explicit and started using the God word and shared about her journey into Christianity which left my dear, dear poetry mentor, friend, and teacher, uh, Steve Cowett, may he rest in peace, uh, a little bit perturbed because <laughs> he, he was more of a non-theist. Let's just leave it at that. So he kind of like, nah, was a little dismissive about Mary Oliver's late period. He liked all that wild geese stuff, but when, he start, when she starts talking about God and grace and all that, he's out. So maybe some of you have that same aversion. Look, I have trouble saying the word God. It has so much baggage for me. I'm like Joseph Campbell, you know, a little bit. He, he grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition, but he, he could never go back to it. He was just so traumatized by his Irish Catholic youth. He's like, I ain't ever doing that again. And he went and became Joseph Campbell. But I find myself torn in all these different directions. So Mary Oliver has a poem. And again, it's not really about God exactly, but it's about the light. It's about the truth and about grace. So here it is. It's a pretty short one. It's called When I Am Among the Trees by Mary Oliver. When I am among the trees, especially the willows and the honey locust, Equally the beech, the oaks, and the pines, they give off such hints of gladness. I would almost say that they save me, and daily. 
I am so distant from the hope of myself in which I have goodness and discernment and never hurry through the world, but walk slowly and bow often. Around me, the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. The light flows from their branches and they call again. It's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine. When I am among the trees by Mary Oliver. Namaste, my friends. Happy Holy Week. Celebrate your presence as the light. See you next time.